Hi everyone, thank you for joining me this evening for a special conversation that I'm going to be having with a very gifted filmmaker. First, I'd like to thank the Japan Society for hosting the conversation as well as Array of the Film Distribution Collective that distributed my film Lingo Franca in the summer and also just released this new film, um, Ainu Mozir, which is directed by Takeshi Fukunaga. Uh, Takeshi, oh, hi Takeshi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Isabel. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here and then have a conversation with you. Likewise. Um, I wanted to also introduce Takeshi as the first filmmaker in the Array family to have had two features released by them. And Takeshi and I are also um, pretty rare <laughs> as Asian American filmmakers because we are among the few who have released more than one feature uh, as Asian American filmmakers. Takeshi, this is of course his second, the first one being Out of My Hand. And before Lingua Franca, I also made and released Senorita and Apparition. Great. Um, Takeshi, I wanted to ask you, can you talk about um, the Netflix premiere of Ainu Mozir. How was it and how does it feel like bringing your second film to a to wider audience via Netflix through Array and the importance of bringing similar stories to an audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for the intro, Isabel. Um, you know, like I'm in Japan, so, you know, like it, it's not, uh, it's going to uh, theaters uh, in Japan right now. So it's it's not on Netflix here yet. But um, I've been seeing, uh, you know, overwhelming reactions, uh, you know, um, of the, from the audience, you know, uh, in the English territories. And then it's been, you know, really wonderful. And I'm super grateful that um, to be able to, you know, share the film with a wider audience on Netflix through Array and then it, it means a lot to um, release it through Array because, you know, there are so many movies on Netflix and in other platforms and then you can be, you can easily be a one of so many that, you know, like nobody noticed. But, um, you know, releasing it, you know, working with Array makes, um, makes a great, you know, deal uh, and makes a great reason, you know, for people to watch it. You know, like from from what I understand, one of their uh, goals, um, you know, of, um, is to uh, bring attention to the underrepresented you know, communities and their voices. And they have followers who are interested in um, listening to that. And yeah. and that's, you know, one of the things I try to do with this film. And then that, you know, makes uh, makes Array a, a perfect partner to, you know, bring this movie into the world. Definitely. Um, can you give us some overview, just for the you know, members of the audience who are not aware yet what Aina Mozir is about, can you give us an overview of the film and how you chose, end up, ended up choosing the subject of the movie for your second feature? Right. Um, so Aina Mozir is about a um, uh, coming of age story uh, of an indigenous Ainu boy who lives in this um, uh, village in northern Japan called Hokkaido. And uh, throughout the film, he tries to come to terms with the loss of his father and also the, um, his roots as, an, uh, as Ainu. And, and, you know, all the, most of the actors are playing a version of themselves those uh, uh, those non actors are people who actually live in that town, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, this is supposed to be the first film, uh, uh, first narrative film about Ainu, uh, starring uh, Ainu people. And uh, the how I came to this film is that uh, I'm I'm born and raised in Hokkaido, Japan. Uh, that's a northern uh, island where uh, Ainu people live, 
But um, growing up, I didn't have a proper education about, you know, uh, about Ainu or their culture or history. And um, it was only after I moved to U.S. when I was 20 and seeing, um, you know, uh, diverse people and raising their voices and, you know, discussing about all different kinds of issues, including um, the one of uh, Native American. And, uh, and then being aware about, you know, those diverse voices and then um, history, you know, between uh, all Native American and US made me finally, you know, realize that I, you know, come, um, I didn't know anything about Ainu. So from, so, uh, you know, I was first had this desire to learn about them and then it became, you know, slowly became um, a pro, uh, project as a, as a film. And, you know, by making this, you know, as I say, this is supposed to be the first film to, you know, um, have a proper representation of Ainu. And then, and then so I made it, you know, with a hope to uh, make a step for a better recognition and understanding of Ainu. I'm curious, how did you meet Kanto, Dabo, and the members of the, you know, Ainu community that became part of the cast for the right. film? Um, so, you know, when I first started the project, I, you know, just went to different parts of Hokkaido and the other parts in Japan to meet with uh, Ainu people and, and then uh, listen to them and then have talk to them to really learn about them. And then um, after visiting different uh, places, um, this, uh, the village uh, where I shot the movie, Akan, was... Um, had just like so many elements you know to construct a story like how they um run the tourism business to uh you know um and then be so um show us you know a version of themselves as i knew you know as a tourist uh for tourists you know and why you know living a more you know common you know day-to-day -day life you know behind the curtain and then there are, you know, uh, a wonderful, you know, uh, people who are in the movie that are uh, living in the town. And, um, you know, because like, of course, like making a movie with no actors, you need a wonderful cast and then a great amount of support from the community. And then Akan was where uh, I found it, you know, like uh, Devo, Kanto and Amy and those wonderful people. Interesting. So there are Ainu villages spread all over Hokkaido? Not quite. Um, there sure. are only a few uh, towns that are known as kind of, um, you know, like Ainu town or the town with a uh, dense uh, Ainu population. Yeah. Um, but, you know, of course there are, you know, uh, they, you know, live, you know, all, all, all over Hokkaido, but there are only a very few uh, places that are known as um, like Ainu town, and then Akan is one of them. Yeah. And uh, I guess I take my turn to ask you a question. Um, sure. <laughs> so, how first, like, how was your experience uh, working with RA, and what it meant to you to share um, Lingua Franca, uh, Lingua Franca? Um, you know, and its story to a wider audience. Yeah, I mean, it was, it has been nothing but a dream, you know, to work with Array, you know, Talene, Rachel, Sharon, and Ava, of course. Um, Ava has always been a champion of underrepresented voices and filmmakers, um, queer filmmakers, you know, persons of color and women filmmakers. And, you know, when you look at the roster of films that Array has distributed, these are what can be considered modern gems, you know, and not just of American cinema, but of world cinema. And, you know, when the film came out in August, I don't think it would have gotten as much attention and support were it not for the hard work and the effort of the RE team 
in getting the film out there. And, you know, the feeling of being a Filipino filmmaker, bringing a Filipino story to Netflix through a ray, you know, feels nothing short of groundbreaking and radical to me. Uh, Lingo Franca had its world premiere at the Venice International Film Festival last year, where I became the first trans woman to have a film ever compete, you know, at the festival in the 76 years. And to bring, to be able to have a film that feels very personal to me, it's not autobiographical, but it's about a perspective and an experience of someone who would otherwise be invisible in, you know, Hollywood films. It's about an undocumented Filipina trans woman, you know, dealing with the feeling of claustrophobia and paranoia and anxiety to live in Trump's America. I think it, the fact that Array has helped it reach such a wide audience, you know, has really created awareness about the communities that I'm, that I'm part of and our experiences as well. So I'm very grateful for Array giving my film the platform that it needs to be seen mm -hmm. by as many people as possible. I, um, I watched the film and then I thought it's, it's such a beautiful film. And uh, you know, it was very poetic. And, and then the way, you know, you, what I loved about the film was um, you, you know, showed, you know, uh, enough about, you know, like, um, like a struggle of being a trans woman or uh, being an Im immigrant, but you don't overly dramatize it, you know? And then like, there is a, those like, um, sometimes it was about, you know, a uh, voice of Trump on the news, you know, why, you know, with over the image of you walking in the street. What, so those, you know, you feel the surrounding and then the kind of psyche of the character, but you never kind of make it so too simple to just to make a story. Was um, was that was that your intention to kind of avoid um, like certain images or um, you know uh, about immigrant or trans woman in the film? Yeah, certainly. And thank you so much for your kind words. I meant lingua franca as as, cin as a cinematic experience to be more subjective and impressionistic. It really puts you as an audience or that's what I aim for it to do, to put the audience in the mental and emotional state of someone like Olivia, um, to feel the tension that she's feeling, the vulnerability and the sense of danger. And, you know, there is a certain expectation for films that touch on topical current issues, like immigration, for instance, or the transgender experience in the US, in, the, in Lingua Franca, there's an expectation that the film will be preachy or didactic or loud and performatively angry, but I, you know, worked from an opposite impulse. I made a film that was delicate and subtle and patient and quiet as an invitation for the audience to, you know, just not grapple with the themes and the characters on the surface level, but to dig deeper and think more critically mm -hmm. and more profoundly mm -hmm. about right. the thing that it's trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I felt that you, that's what you were trying to do. And then um, an invitation to a certain underrepresented voice is uh, such a, poignant way to describe it and um you know and then uh that's one of the things i try to do with uh, animals here as well um but much you know, oh thank you um you know th th this is not you know uh all about i knew of course it's it's just a, a one story uh of these particular people uh in one film and um but um you know in for me um, you know, I'm not Ainu, so, you know, to, for me to tell 
um, you know, story of um, Ainu, uh, I was, you know, I try to be very, very careful about how to um, honor their uh, voices and then how to um, bring them uh, into the uh, process of making the film yeah. as much as possible. So, you know, there was a, a script, of course, but half of the uh, dialogues were uh, improvised to, to, and then that was one of the ways uh, for me to kind of um, bring as much their uh, natural selves into the film. And so to avoid, you know, like you say, uh, certain images or, uh, yeah. you know, like impose any uh, preconceived ideas, uh, notions on them. And what was that experience like? Were, were there any particular challenges, you know, foreseen or otherwise when it came to, you know, telling the story of an Aino community and... Yeah, well, there are many, many challenges. I mean, like, you know, first of all, working with no actors, you know, they are not, you know, of course, you know, we, you know, um, there are like compensations for their you know, performance and, you know, for, for their time and effort, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they have their own, you know, own lives, you know, uh, you know, um, so like Kanto, the main, you know, character, of course, you know, you know, goes to school. So we have to, you know, make a schedule around it. And then so there are many like, you know, practical challenges, but also, you know, to, to show, you know, to tell a story about, you know, Ainu living in today and then without avoiding those like, um, um, you know, again, like a painting a, a particular image, you know, it was, you know, of course I try to, you know, study and then learn about them as much as possible before shooting. Yeah. But there was, you know, there was, there could be always um, a misstep, you know, that I could make and then, so, to avoid that, you know, like I say, you know, um, for me, the only way for me to avoid it is to, you know, bring them, uh, those, you know, uh, I don't know actors uh, to the creative process as much as possible. Yeah. You know, that was from starting from writing and then of course on the production. How, <clears throat> I'm curious, how difficult or how long did it take for you to build a relationship with the members of the Ainu community? enough for you to be given, you know, seemingly unlimited, you know, access to, to their lives and their experiences? Um, you know, it was just time and patience, I guess, you know, like I probably went to the, um, the village like four, five or five, six times before we shot the movie and then spent time, uh, you know, knowing them and knowing each other. And, um, you know, again, you know, there are, you know, of course, it, this is one version of, you know, of them uh, in this particular film. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I hope there will be, you know, more movies or other uh, mediums that, you know, shows uh, the other sides of, uh, you know, them and then uh, Ainu people as a whole. Yeah. Um, because I can imagine, like, the bear ceremony, that was, is that considered like a very private ceremony for, for the Ainu? Uh, yeah, well, it's a con controversial one. You know, it's, uh, the last time it was done uh, in public on the record is uh, back in 1990 uh, in another town called Shiraoi. So that's uh, 30 years ago. And, um, and then, you know, there are um, people who agree or uh, want to do it and other people who, you know, don't want to do, you know, like, you know, it's showed in the movie. And then their reasons are so diverse and, you know, uh, different from one, uh, uh, from each other. And so to show uh, the ritual, uh, was really uh, a way to show those, you know, diverse voices and then, you know, uh, emotions uh, around the ritual. And then through that, I thought, you know, I hope to um, show their um, inner struggles or, you know, uh, how it's like to be uh, Ainu in today's society. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm curious, I have one, one more question about that. Like, 
what are the sentiments of the members of the community? And you're not, you know, you don't have to answer if you don't feel like you're comfortable answering it. Like, are, is there, um, are there many of them that want to, just as, you know, Kanto intimated early in the film, were there any a strong sentiment to leave the community or stay, the commun stay in the community, especially for the younger ones? Um, <clears throat> well, the, it's, it's complicated, you know, it's of course, it's different from one, um, from one another. And, yeah. and then, but for Kanto, well, first of all, you know, um, realistically, there's no high school near that town. So almost, you know, every kid, you know, has to go to another town after uh, they graduate from junior high school. And Kanto now is in the high school and then actually uh, moved out of that town. Um, but um, when we started shooting, Kanto was actually feeling hesitant to kind of practice uh, Ainu, like dance or the, that kind of pr traditional practices. Yeah. And, and instead he was a lot more uh, interested in playing you know, like American song with his, you know, uh, his friends. And, yeah. and then and that's something, you know, not necessarily particularly about Ainu, but just, uh, you know, um, a boy, uh, adolescence kid, you know, living in, you know, today's society, you know, like it's, it's, it's a lot more fun to, do something that they think it's cool than, you know, what adults, you know, tell them to do. Yeah. And then it was, you know, the same for him. And so that part of, you know, um, that side of him, I, I, I feel like it's, you know, just a kind of, you know, universal um, character, you know, for, and then something that we all, you know, went through. Yeah. yeah. As a Japanese filmmaker, how did, making Ainu Muzir um, affect you as a Japanese person? For me, mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, important, you know, for me to learn about them. And then um, not just as a Japanese person, but also as a person from Hokkaido, you know, where, you know, yeah. uh, they are, uh, Ainu people are native to. And, and then, that was uh, uh, very important for me. Uh, first of all, not necessarily as a filmmaker, but as a person. And then, and then that uh, learning, um, you know, experience or uh, desire to learn will continue after this movie. You know, yeah. it, it's uh, I never kind of I shouldn't ever be an arrogant to feel like I you know know enough. You know, I should you know keep learning. And then that's that's an um, you know necessary step for, um, you know, better recognition and a better uh, society. And then like I knew are still very much underrepresented in the Japanese society. Uh, if you ask most of a uh, Japanese person, they wouldn't know anything about Ainu really, yeah. aside from just the name and a few things. Oh, wow. so, yeah, so, so the situation is very uh, not severe than like, one for Native American as far in US as far as uh, recognition goes. Mm -hmm. And um, so making this movie was uh, um, was a kind of a unique um, opportunity for many people to really get a sense of, you know, uh, who Ainu people are and then uh, what their situation is like. And, and then for that alone, I, I feel that I, you know, um, that I'm grateful that I could, you know, make this movie, you know, of course, with a great amount of support from, uh, you know, the no actors and then their community. That's great. Uh, how, how is it, how is it like to be a Filipino filmmaker based in US? I, I assume you live in New York? Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it has its own sets of, you know, set of hurdles and challenges. Uh, but Lingo Franca was not you know, especially daunting or challenging to make, you know, I mean, I made it outside of the Hollywood studio system. Clearly, I made the film with a group of Filipino immigrant artists who believed in the story 
its mm-hmm. urgency and its importance and who supported me in my creative decisions and my vision for the film from day one. And I really owe it to the fellow Filipino artists that you know, have been working hard to make the film happen. We've had a few hiccups, you know, of course, uh, delicate balance that we struck with the budget. I was able to make a film that I wanted to make, you know, mm-hmm. both in its theme and its aesthetic sensibility. And for that reason, it feels like a gamble in that I wasn't making creative compromises or dumbing it down to make it more palatable or accessible to a mainstream quote, you know, parentheses, white, you know, cisgender (laughs) general Mm -hmm. public. I made a film that I wanted to watch Mm -hmm. myself and for the film to be received as warmly as it has, like, you know, getting the attention of Venice Film Festival, um, Ava and Array, you know, speaks to the power of authenticity and telling your story, you know, fearlessly and freely. So. Do you think um, the situation uh, is changing for you as a filmmaker and then industry as a whole for Asian filmmakers? Um, certainly, I mean, every time there's a movie with headlined by an Asian star or cast, like Crazy Rich Asians two years ago, you know, Hollywood always like acts surprised. So I think, and I know that you know, the farewell also came out last year, this year, year we have Minari. I think it's also very important for Asian filmmakers to continue, you know, putting the pressure on Hollywood and holding Hollywood accountable to really, you know, bring more diversity and representation to studio productions that are being made, you know, because there is definitely no shortage of Asian talent, you know, as you and I prove. (laughs) And on our part as filmmakers, we should also continue to push for making films and telling stories that ring true, you know, to our experiences, because that's how we can continue to be unique, distinctive and original voices. If we tell stories from our own experience that no one else is telling and that no one else can tell with as much honesty and power as we can. Mm -hmm. What do you think, (laughs) Takeshi? Well, it seems like it's changing to uh, Mm -hmm. a better direction, but at the same time, there's still a long way to go. You know, like I, um, you know, like I taking meetings on Zoom and like Skype, you know, uh, you know, recently uh, with some like producers and production companies in the U.S. And then there seem to be a lot more interested in being a part of you know, uh, projects that are uh, centering around, you know, Asian or Japanese or doesn't seem like it's, it's as big hurdle as it used to be for them. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they are, you know, also very cautious about um, the risk of, you know, um, like being, um, yeah, be, about those projects from the commercial pers- you know standpoint of view and 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 you're right you know like it's it's we can't just keep waiting for them to change you know we just have to do what we can and then push it forward and and then urge them to change <laughs> and listen to us more um and then uh you know like it's it's these days you know, there are Netflix and, you know, uh, and so many other, you know, streaming platforms and so many ways to uh, watch movies. And, and then the border, you know, between uh, of the, the country or the language is, is you know, uh, like a lot 
less than um, it used to be, I feel like, you know, for example, having, you know, like you releasing the, you know, uh, lingua franca uh, with, you know, I mean, mostly English language, but also, you know, it has a Filipino uh, Tagalog uh, lines. And, you know, my film is all in, in uh, Japanese, uh, well, with some, you know, Ainu languages. Mm. And then that's on, you know, released on Netflix into a wider audience. And that, couldn't have happened, you know, several years ago, I feel like. Speaking of projects, so can you tell us more about, you know, what, what you're cooking next, um, what you've been working on? Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it takes place in northern part of main island, Honshu, uh, called Tohoku. And um, it's a period piece, so it's a lot more fiction than uh, first two films I made, uh, working with professional actors. Okay. Um, and um, what do I say? It's it, it's based on uh, old uh, folk tales, and so it has some of a, a fantastical element to it. But uh, it in in the nutshell, it's about. Um, us, it takes place in a small village surrounded by mount, by mountain, and it's about uh, common people uh, struggling to find their way through uh, for uh, for a better place, you know, for them yeah, yeah. in the society and then in, yeah, in their life. That's kind of a general uh, explanation about it. What about you? What uh, is there a project you're working on? Um, yeah, I'm actually um, working on hopefully the final revision to my next feature film called Tropical Gothic. So it is set in the 16th century in the Philippines. Oh, wow. Very early during the Spanish colonial regime because we used to be a colony of Spain for over 300 years. So it's about a native priestess, a native Filipina priestess who pretends to be possessed by the spirit of the dead bride of her Spanish master slash landlord um, in order to avenge the fact that she was dispossessed. So her property was seized from her by the Spanish colonizers. Um, and it's my riff on Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. So oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to be finishing that you know, during the holidays. And I also am writing the pilot episode for a TV series that I'm developing that was picked up um, this past summer. And I actually just got back from a, a short film shoot in Savannah, Georgia. I starred in it this time, I didn't direct it, but um, mm. that reimagines scenes from iconic Hollywood movies, but this time starring a woman of color slash me. So we redid uh, scenes from Clockwork Orange, Blue Velvet, Douglas Sirks, All That Heaven Allows, Vertigo. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot going on and it sounds so exciting, all of them. So I'm here and Inga Franca are on Netflix right now. And, you know, it's, Ringo Franca is, is a beautiful film, um, you know, please go watch it. It's such a rare type of film that you don't really see in uh, other films. You know, it's, it's Isabel is such, has a, such a unique voice and I'm super excited for watching for your new project. Um, and and uh, likewise, <laughs> thank you. Again, um, Mozir, you know, is just as tender and heartwarming and just like Lingua Franca, it's a film and a story about otherwise invisible lives, you know, and a society that doesn't really pay that much attention mm -hmm. to them. And uh, Takashi has shown a truly lovely light in this community, the Aino community of Hokkaido. Thank you so much. It, yeah, uh, it means a lot to hear that from you. Um, and um, thank you. I would like to thank Japan Society and RA for hosting this conversation. And Isabel, I had such a pleasure talking to you. 
and uh, hope Pleasure to see my Takeshi. Yeah, and uh, hope to talk to you soon and meet yes. you in person. <laughs> yes, hopefully, you know, when this pandemic is over. <laughs> All right. All right, stay safe.